Eclipse. We want to talk about the community infrastructure. Um, so first off, what do we have? So what's uh, so when we talk about community infrastructure at Eclipse, what do we give our community? And and there was a also the other topic was how do we relate with uh, things like GitHub and so on. So we at Eclipse have a complete forge. There's a couple of things up there that might you might not understand, like what the heck is IPzilla and what is PMI. <laughs> Um, so IPZilla is basically, it's, our, it's an instance of Bugzilla that we forked to add some extra workflow stuff. Uh, and that's what we use for managing all of our uh, intellectual property. Um, so the thing that we're really uh, careful about at Eclipse is we do an, a complete analysis of all of the third party dependencies that our open source projects rely on. And we do a deep dive into every single one of those in, um, all the way down. So the world's record so far at Eclipse was somebody, you know, a developer wanted to use one library. <clears throat> and by the time we exploded the whole thing, it was 64 libraries nested six deep. And we go, it's turtles all the way down. We go all the way. Um, and the project management infrastructure is we, uh, we forked a copy of the, the uh, Drupal project module and have a fairly exhaustive API, or very, fairly exhaustive web, web thing that manages all of the project metadata. So... What, your, what are your plans, what was your proposal years ago, um, and all that kind of stuff. And it, what are your committer lists, how to, running committer votes, all that kind of stuff. And uh, then we use Garrett, Git, uh, Build is uh, you know, continuous integration. We use Hudson because Hudson is an Eclipse project. Then we have signing um, and then we have release and downloads and that's basically a straight pipeline um, for all of our projects that want to use this. Now, interestingly enough, about half of our projects actually don't use sort of much below Git. Um, they can do their own builds and so on. Um, a couple of years ago, we decided that we had to embrace GitHub. I'll talk a little bit more about why. Uh, and, but the thing, about, uh, the thing about GitHub is we actually, we, we manage it. Um, so all of the Eclipse projects that do host their day-to-day -day development are under the Eclipse Foundation organization. We have all the admin rights to their, to, their, uh, um, to their repos and so on. And we then clone everything back onto our own infrastructure uh, so that if, they, um, um, if GitHub went away tomorrow, you know, we could still keep going. So one of the things that we built is we have a GitHub hook um, so that we can verify uh, for one of our committers that before they uh, uh, do a pull request or before they accept the pull request that the person who wrote that pull request has signed the Eclipse, contr uh, the Eclipse contributor agreement. The, um, that's open source by the way if anybody else wants to do similar stuff um, you can talk to me I can show you where the GitHub repo is uh, and uh, you're happy, you know, happy to see people use that. Uh, and as I mentioned we, we manage those GitHub repos for them so our our IT staff um, take care, takes care of that for, uh, for the projects. So that's kind of like, this is kind of like what we, what we have, right? Um, so any questions on that before I move on? Pretty straightforward. So then next thing is why did we do th the GitHub stuff? Um, it was actually a fairly, a fairly large amount of work for us to do uh, in 2013. And First and foremost is go where the developers are. Um, the second thing that we did is, as part and parcel of the same project, uh, we changed the way that we accepted contributions to this CLA approach and using Git signed by and so on. And, the, um, and that was all about lowering barriers to contribution. Uh, so that's, that's definitely one of the things that we weren't doing very well at Eclipse. We, arguably, we're still not, we still have, our barriers are still too high because we're so careful about the intellectual property, but, on the, but we've, we've definitely made it a lot easier for a contributor to get, to get code into an Eclipse project. And the other thing is we've actually attracted a couple of projects that were, you know, they started on GitHub and they decided that for various reasons they wanted to go to a foundation and the fact that they could stay and keep their day-to-day -day development on GitHub was actually something that was really important to them. Um, one thing I didn't really talk about is you notice Bugzilla goes all the way across the top there. And, the re and so we don't allow our projects to use GitHub issues. Because we actually think of a couple of these things like, well, first of all, GitHub issues mostly sucks. Um, but then, but part of the thing is, one of the principles that we matter about is, or we care about, is that 
when, it, when somebody wants to come and look at an Eclipse project, we don't want them to know, have to learn 17 different um, issue trackers in order to understand to what's going on with that project. So we stick with Bugzilla. So the key principles that we apply whenever we're looking at any of this stuff around infrastructure are these two. One, vendor neutral. And uh, um, Eclipse is maniacally vendor neutral. Uh, so for example, um, you know, the Apache Software Foundation uses JIRA. So they've got a free license from Atlassian to use JIRA. We can't do that because Eclipse actually is set up as a trade association. So we have corporate members. Once you start accepting free software from corporations, where does it stop? And how do you say yes to one company and no to another? So everything in our infrastructure has to be open source. And by the way, please, somebody in the open source community either f tell the Bugzilla guys to get their head out of the ass and fix their stuff or make something as good that looks more like Jira that actually is open source. Um, and the other thing we care about is freedom of action. So, you know, I talked a bit about the way we, we clone everything from GitHub back to our own stuff. And if GitHub goes away tomorrow, we can keep going. And that's one of the perspectives that we take on everything we do is if we're going to use anything from an out, as an outside service and that we're turning more and more into like a software as a service kind of world and in many cases hosting your stuff is a, ridiculous, a ridiculously expensive option relative to what you can do elsewhere. But freedom of action is important. No matter what service that you use, if they went away tomorrow or started charging for it or were complete jerks about it, you have to be able to say, yep, thanks very much, but we can, you know, we're... We're an institution that is independent and has a lifespan far beyond your own. Thank you very much, but we're going to go elsewhere. So, um, you know, what have we, what have we learned? Um, embracing external tools actually is, is complementary and makes sense in the context of an open source foundation like Eclipse. Uh, but you, like, you have to apply those principles when, that I just mentioned earlier about, about how you go about doing it. Uh, lowering barriers to contribution, you know, we've got some graphs that I can show you that, you know, when we started doing things like switching to Git, using Garrett, getting onto GitHub and so on, the, the, the number of authors of contribution that, we've, that we're getting at Eclipse is currently doing about that, um, which is super important um, to, to any open source community. Um, and something that we frankly neglected um, or didn't put enough energy into for far too long. Um, but you have to be true to your principles. Um, so I think we've sort of boiled it down to those two key principles and we apply that thinking to pretty much every single thing we do. And I think it's actually done, it's done well by us. Um, so um, feel free to, uh, to, uh, to copy that if you want. And then the last thing is like, you know, one of the questions for the group was, what is the role of the foundations in this brave new world and so on? And do, does foundations um, have a role to play? And I mean, obviously I'm biased because I work at a foundation, but um, I absolutely believe that foundations are, are if anything, even more important um, than, than they were before. And largely, like these things that are up there, neutral governance is a really big one. Um, the stewardship of trademarks um, is just so important, and it's such a misunderstood or neglected thing. Like, you know... Um, uh, just to show you, Node.js is a great example of a wonderful technology in a great community. It's totally screwed because one company owns the uh, trademark. And there's like dozens more like that, right? And, you know, joints, you know, fairly shamelessly taking advantage of the fact that Node.js is a successful trademark. And, um, you know, that's, in my view, one of the things that's a critically important and often overlooked value of foundations. The simple fact that the trademark is owned by a vendor neutral independent organization that makes use of that trademark appropriately available to everybody, um, not just one. IP management, and then the last one is sustainability. I mean, I think you know, open source foundations are doing quite well in terms of showing that they have, they have the structures and the infrastructure and the, mo the sort of business models, whatever they may be, to last. We have now, you know, Eclipse Foundation is, rel is one of the relatively new ones, and we're a decade old and I think going pretty strong. So it's, uh, I think you can point out that, that foundations um, do provide projects a, a level of sustainability um, that they can't necessarily get on their own. And the last sort of just thing to think about is open source is this vastly overloaded term to the point of almost being horrendous. Um, 
And in particular, open source is really a statement about licensing. It's not a statement about how the code is development and developed. And although I just, you know, we, I think many of us here describe ourselves as a, you know, either a free software or an open source person, you know, what we forget that you know, those are primarily licensing. It, it many are often interpreted as a statement of our opinion about licensing. Deep in our hearts, I think everybody in this room are actually open development people. We actually really care about the fact that the code has to be developed in an open and transparent process run by self-governing meritocracies and that's sort of a fundamental thing that set of values that I think everybody in the room agrees upon and the sort of steady conflation of open source and open development frankly just pisses me off and it's something that I'm hoping that we can collectively address over the next couple of years because it's getting to the point where the, the values that we care about are being hijacked by people that explicitly don't care about or don't share our values. And I think that's it. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I, yeah, just, a quick, or just a, a, um, a quick support for your last statement that um, the, uh, since you're not going to get here to hear me say it, I just want to say it really quickly. I think that Open source software is an application of the scientific method, and that has to be applied across everything. You can't just say, we're scientific like this, but over here we think that you know, magic falls from the clouds or something. And, in, and, in, and we have to get people to really see that so that yeah. they'll, and so you're right, it's really important we don't let people steal that word. Yeah, I mean, the there's, a, there's a couple of guys that I know in Germany that have, write this really interesting blog about, this, they call it the second renaissance. The notion that both in software and hardware, what we're seeing today is this world where power is being um, diffused from central, cent much more centralized to much more distributed and w people are being enabled to do things that they couldn't do before. And yeah, the, I totally buy into the scientific method approach and if you sort of read the history of sort of what science was like in the 1600s versus the patent, uh, <laughs> you know, let's patent everything approach to actual true science that we have today. And then think about what that means and uh, as application to open, to, to free and open software. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of you know threads in there, and but that you know sort of goes back to trademarks. In some ways, you know, ownership of the trademarks is the is the patent of um, free and open source development. Um, because if you can sort of have you know sucker a community into giving you their love and energy, and then own the trademark, um, even if you don't necessarily own the copyright for the software, or, uh, you know, it's maybe if it's diffused or you don't necessarily own every patent you still have an illegitimate authority over that, um, over that community um, that it will, over time, almost always poorly serve that community. I think, I think trademarks are a vastly underestimated power. No? No. I don't oh, yes, sorry. On, on the infrastructure, um, do you, everything is run within the Eclipse, I mean, the team, the Eclipse yeah, team. Well, how do you make the decisions if you want, if you need to evolve the infra this infrastructure? Oh, that's, okay, actually, we I think we have a... Re community yeah, yeah, so, no, actually, we don't pull the community. So, look, like, so, it's an open source community. We have no shortage of good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's actually, I think we have a really great process. So I'll uh, give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, starting about two years ago, we had a guy, um, uh, Michael Estra Estria from uh, Red Hat, who was like absolutely adamant that the Eclipse community had to adopt Sonar, right? It was like, this is cool stuff. We need to do this quality metrics. Like you guys are idiots for not already using it, blah, 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 blah. All right, so Michael, here's your virtual machine. Go, go install Sonar go start evangelizing it around the community, come back when you've got, I don't know, 30 projects using it. And he did. So he got his, we gave him his VM, he installed Sonar, he maintained it, he evangelized it, got a whole bunch of projects excited about using it. And then he came back to us and said, look, this is really working. And then at that point we said, okay, we'll bring that inside and make it part of our supported services. And it's migrating over into our webmaster team and it's moving from this little rinky-dink virtual machine into some real hardware. And we take it over. But the key point is, you know, call their bluff, right? Here's your virtual machine, go fill your boots and then see how it goes. And we've had some colossal failures as well. So that's, <laughs> it's sort of like, yeah, you know, if nobody wants it. Screening process. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but actually it has the advantage too that you get what it happens, you get a small community of people inside your broader community 
that are excited about using this and evangelizing it. And so we're not, so then it doesn't come like, oh, the big bad Eclipse Foundation is telling us what we got to use. It's more like, hey dudes, this is really happening and it's really helping and you should be using it. And it's, so it's echoing inside the community and then all of a sudden, oh, the Eclipse Foundation is doing a great thing because they're actually going to start officially supporting this and making more resources available. And so now we're the good guys, not the bad guys, right? So, I, so I, that's, we kind of stumbled across that, but I'd highly recommend it. Uh, another question about the, um, uh, the resources, the compute and storage resource. Is this something you own, yeah. you outsource? So every year, filter, every, year my, every year my board goes, what are you doing? You're an idiot. You should be using cloud, blah, 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 blah. Well, first of all, most of our hardware was free. Like people gave us stuff. Okay. Um, and second of all, um, it, uh, one thing you can't do in Amazon, at least I'm not smart enough to figure out how to do, is how to throttle your bandwidth. So we have a relationship with our ISP. So we peak at 210 megabits per second, and we don't have to pay for any more than that. As far as I know, you can't do that on Amazon. We Just for jokes, every once in a while, we'll like take the throttle off and see where it goes. And Eclipse.org pegs at a gigabit per second, 24-7, 364 days of the year. Um, so if you do the math of what it talks to transfer a gigabit per second, um, 24-7, 364, um, that's about four times what we currently pay for our IT infrastructure, including the staff. So it just, so thanks, but we got free hardware, we got a really smoking deal from our ISP, it's all good. Free hardware. Yeah. I sometimes refer to myself as a professional beggar. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like I'm shameless. <laughs> it's like, hey, you guys sell hardware. One, can I have some? <laughs> it's like, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Mike.